Swan uh, is working on giving you guys a, uh, a homework on the reinforcement journey. And that would be much shorter than the one that you already completed. And that basically, most likely, you'll just be doing uh, implementation of Q learning on top of your MDP solver. Okay? And then you play with uh, both the exploration with uh, and without exploration. You know, how do you basically just check what you've already shown? Okay? That uh, you implement Q learning and then you see. Um, how useful is exploration, you know. Um, so that's going to be the, the project for the reinforcement learning. And in fact, somebody was asking me uh, what is the percentage of credit for homeworks versus exams. Um, I think given, I mean, I'm sort of going to wait for, uh, to want to have, you know, to go through the homeworks and the project that you turned in. Um, um, basically, it turned out to be more um, I think it's more um, uh, comprehensive than the homeworks that people had done last time around in this course. So I am, you know, to the extent you do a good job on that, then I prefer going with problem sets, you know, higher preference, to higher weight to the homeworks and problem sets. And we'll have some exam, but, you know, uh, there isn't too much I can do in like a short uh, midterm exam, you know, other than figuring out the sanity, okay? Um, and then as long as you're spending time, you know, actually doing the programming, actually doing more interesting problems, uh, for the reinforcement learning, there's not going to be any separate problem set other than the programming problem. Um, but some of the other ones, you will have actual problems. And so they will have uh, more of a credit, more of a weight. Okay? And uh, if there is enough of this coming in, then basically, I think it, it's not the case. I, I don't know whether I actually showed a weightage before for the uh, exams and for, uh, homeworks, but I think um, certainly the homeworks, you cannot assume they're like 5% of the weight. You know, they are actually very important. And I think that's what you did too, I mean, based on you know, the stack that I had to carry. Uh, I'm assuming that you can spend that. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. And you know, to some extent, that's reasonable too, because you probably have to that's the only way to learn graduate level material, you know, um, other than just. And then how much you learn depends to some extent on you. I mean, there are variations. It's true in undergrad level too, but in grad level, some people will know a lot about a certain topic, and you know, some don't. You know, and I think that's also coming through in some of the reviews and the answers that and, and the comments people are posting. I mean, I don't come out and call people saying, you know, you're shallow or you're deep, uh, but, you know, I think it's obvious. This just depends on how important it is. It's a gradual course. Okay, so that's regarding the, the homeworks uh, and, you know, that you should continue to take them seriously and that uh, reinforcement learning one is coming soon. Um, and then, as you can see, actually, from last class and, you know, continuing today's class, there's, like, a huge parallelism between reinforcement learning and what we're doing right now. It's essentially approximate methods for MDPs. You almost have to, you know, pull your hair to make sure that you understand why this is called uh, reinforcement learning versus approximate method for MDP. You know, so it's a question of, do you have the model and decided to not look at it, or don't you have the model? So that turns out to be the most important issue. And many a time, even when you have the model, you decide not to look at it. Okay, and in fact, in the case of LRTDP, which we discussed last class, it is it has the model and it is actually looking at the model. Pretty much, it's looking at all aspects of the model. Okay, it's just that it was doing. It's actually useful to think of LRTDP as more like a prioritized sweeping kind of algorithm, where it's trying to decide which states' values should be updated more often than which other states. Okay. But it is using everything in the model. It is using the, the probabilities, it's using the rewards, it's using everything in the model, right? Uh, in fact, today we'll look at UCT, which is a competitor for LRTDP. Um, and that sort of uses uh, the model as almost as if it's a simulator. Okay? And, and, and you know, it has some advantages. In fact, that same, remember we talked about when is it worthwhile doing simulator. You know, whenever you do model-free learning, then, you know, that's kind of, you know, basically that's too hard to reason with the models. And we'll see it again today. 
Um, so I haven't, I know that most, several of you, I don't know whether all of you did, but several of you did post the reviews uh, for the paper. Um, since this is the first time I gave, and since it is like only two days, uh, I would basically um, request that people who did not complete still go ahead and post the reviews. Okay, even though it's today, I said you should have it by today. Um, and then for the later onwards, you know, basically follow the timeline. Now typically what I'll try to do is have the paper assigned for reviewing um, on Wednesday so that you have time until Monday. Uh, you know, Monday to Wednesday is much harder. Wednesday to Monday is easier. Okay, so that's what I'll do. So I will give one more paper that you should read <laughs> by Monday. But, you know, the ones that you did not, you know, review, please do write review. I mean, I know several of you did already post the reviews. Okay. And I haven't read the, all the reviews anyway. So, but uh, I did notice that there are people um, So, one aspect of the paper that uh, I want to draw the attention today is, you know, I said like LRDDP can use heuristic, right? You know, initialize with some value function and then you're using that to actually update, and then you get better value functions. And one of the questions is, uh, one of the points is that if you initialize with an admissible value function, and because again, I don't know if you noticed, but all the time in reinforcement learning literature, we thought of value as reward. Okay, here value is cost because we are talking about you know planning. From planning perspective, values are cost. From learning perspective, they tend to be values are rewards. But you know you can. You know, so, so in, in fact, in you know the, the, the technically, I think, where convention is normally in some people, some people use V for the value function and J for the cost function. So I could have talked in terms of J star uh, and value you know, iteration over J as again as iteration over V. But you know, we just we actually used V in most of the discussion last time, so I'll continue using it. Just remember that value now we are talking about is the cost. Okay, and when value is cast, connections to heuristics are very easy to make because heuristics for the case star search were cast. And, uh, and the heuristics were supposed to find a lower bound on the true cast for them to be admissible. Okay, and that's the basic idea. And again, if you don't know A star search, please figure it out. Okay, I mean, because you know, I cannot redo that, you know, it's, it's you know, intro, intro to AI. Every intro to AI would have done it. And my lectures on ASTAR search are available. You know, you can go figure it out. Um, uh, so, the important thing, of course, is heuristic should be lower bounds um, on the true cost. You may not know often what is the true cost, and yet you may be able to come up with you know, lower bounds. That's the interesting thing, okay? And the classic example that people talk about, we talked about in 471, for example, is, uh, you know, irrespective of what are the obstacles in, in a free space, you know, uh, if you're trying to find the lower bound distance you have to travel uh, to that corner, you take the as crow flies distance, the straight line distance. And, and in some sense, heuristics come by relaxing the problem. Not some sense, actually. That's the way to think about it. Heuristics come by, admissible heuristics are you know, generated by relaxing the constraints of the problem. So in this particular case, I just relax my constraints and I thought normally I'm actually unable to walk through tables and people, but uh, if I have that magical ability, that means if I relax the constraint that I can't walk through tables, then, in fact, I would have just walked straight to that car. That would have been the optimal path to that point. So heuristics are really optimal solutions for relaxed versions of the problem. Okay, that's where it comes from. Okay, so they did talk in their paper, in the experiment section, they talked about <laughs> heuristics. People all looked at it, right? Right. So essentially, they point out that the value function, basically, you have this is the you know recurrence relation for the value function. Uh, the, the Bellman uh, equation for the value function. And if you just solve it directly, you'll get the V star S. Right? And then that would be a great heuristic. It's just that you'll spend just as much time computing the heuristic, you know, as to solve the original problem. But, so what they tried, I don't know how many of you figured this out, how many of you 
not this, but what they wound up doing is they relax this to this. Right? What actually did they do there? And why is this easy? I mean, those of you who already wrote reviews, maybe you can help me. Yes. Minimum of what? So what exactly are they relaxing here? It's the minimum cost of the next day, regardless of probabilities. Yes, they're saying minimum cost to the next day. Uh, yeah. So, so what? So what did they relax essentially? What constraint did they relax intuitively? The probability of reaching all st state is equivalent. I mean, the probability is uh, evened out. Even if it's a rare state, you will reach that state. So, yeah, go down to that. So, so to some extent, what's actually happening is, in a sense, if, I mean, so you have, it's, it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a small change to the equation, but it's actually a pretty far-reaching change to what you are computing. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so all they did was, in the top case, they say, take the sum of all. Yeah. In the bottom, they just say, take the best one. I understand. I know that I can see. <laughs> that I can see. But I want you to understand what is the part, what exactly are the consequences of this? Why is this so cheaper to you know compute as again as that? So this one is the deterministic. Exactly. First of all, it's deterministic. Okay, this one is deterministic. So there is no actual probabilities involved. So it, you're solving a deterministic problem. Point one. Point two, what deterministic problem are you solving? So you are assuming, so here is the interesting thing. So suppose I am a state here, right? And my actions are such that I have like, there is one neighbor who eventually will become really rich. They're, you know, they basically are close to like goal somewhere. And so they will become very rich. Except for the actions that I have, the probability that that action will take me there is close to zero. And I have another loser neighbor who is not very rich, but there's a higher probability that I'll go there. Okay, so when you did determinism, what did you do actually? So here is the interesting thing. So if you think in terms of each action, each action being, so remember me, this is how we'll write, right? State S, and here is an action, and it will take you to S1. S2, S3, let's say. That's a probabilistic action. Right? Now you made this action deterministic. That's what you guys said. Exactly how did you make it deterministic? Optimistically. Did you make it optimistically? How many people think you made it optimistically? What does optimistic mean? So, what is best option? The one that gives you more money. More money, okay. Not would you know, so the point is, would you know upfront which option will give you the best option? Because notice that even if in fact your, your grid is a deterministic grid, it's not quite clear. Even if in fact in all those grids that I drew, even if your actions were non-noisy, it's not quite clear how to go from where you are to where you want to go with the shortest path. Because you might think, oh, this looks like it's on the way, it's on the uh, as close flight path, okay? Except then I keep going there, and then I'll hit a, um, uh, I'll hit a obstacle. Then I have to backtrack and go in a different way. So you don't know. Just because you know, we are used to thinking that probabilistic is bad, deterministic is good. But it's not so much that deterministic is extremely easy to solve, right? Deterministic pathfinding is polynomial in the size of the graph. Optimal path in a graph of size n is, you know, polynomial in the size of the graph. Okay, so to actually figure out which of these action, which of these outcomes would be the most, so so in some sense, to figure out which direction you have to go, you don't know which of the outcomes is actually the best. So I'll argue, I'll argue the following thing. So first of all, I hope you realize that you don't know upfront which outcome is going to be best for you. This is only going to be found in hindsight. Having found the optimal path, then I, you'll hope that, oh, I just hope that if my optimal path winds up having this action, and, 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 and I hope that S1 happens after this action, 
then I'm really determinizing this action as S to S1. To actually compute this, what you need to do, if you think from an action-centric perspective, I would argue that what you did is you took this action and converted it into three actions. One action is, another action is, another action is, and these are independent. Okay, if I throw all these actions into your deterministic planning problem, it will figure out which action it should take to get to the optimal path. Did you get that? Okay, so in one fell swoop, by just changing this summation into min over the probabilities, and then do the recurrence, and then figure out what the um, optimal v would be, optimal v would be, you are in essence solving a deterministic version of the probabilistic problem where actions are split into one version of the action for each of its outcomes. Okay, an action which had three outcomes, S1, S2, S3, has been split into three completely independent actions. And the relaxation you did is, oh, I can wish whichever outcome that action will give as based on what I feel like I need at that time. And then having computed the optimal path, I will know that basically, okay, I'm going to take this action and I will want S1. That's the relaxation. Okay? And this idea can be thought of as all outcome determination. So there are like two points that are coming up here. One is you computed, you computed the heuristic for a stochastic problem by relaxing something. What did you relax? You relaxed the probabilities. So you went from stochastic to deterministic. Now when you are doing it, you essentially somehow have to convert the stochastic actions into deterministic actions. And the way, you, in essence, what you wound up doing, if you're doing this, what you wound up doing is you split it into one action for each outcome, one deterministic action for each outcome. It increases the number of actions, but underlying problem becomes very simple deterministic. And you know, dynamic programming can actually be used for deterministic planning. Dijkstra's algorithm. How many of you know Dijkstra's algorithm? And what does it do? It does dynamic programming for the you know graph, the shortest graph. So it's just computing, you know, dynamic, same for dynamic programming except on a deterministic problem where there are more actions, and then it finds the shortest path in that. That becomes that becomes now having seen this, now you can see why this heuristic, I know I'll get to you, why this heuristic is a lower bound. Right? Because you are hoping for the best outcome for each action. You know, in fact, one of the interesting things, by the way, when you did this, right, you notice that I might wind up doing the same action multiple times and expecting different outcomes, different times. Because I split this action into three different actions now. Right? It's as if these guys don't know that they are connected somehow by nature. Only one of them will happen, really speaking. But you're acting as if you know you can make a specific one that will be on the optimal path for you, will happen. And that's basically the reason why this is, of course, guaranteed to be a um, lower bound. Yes? This question. So this means the first mean is over the whole uh, expression, right? That is not mean of C of it yeah, is different. That, yeah. Plus, you know, I mean, yes, then it yes. will not make sense. The mean should be over the whole thing, right? On both of them. So yeah, yeah. Over, yeah. over all actions, yes. Yeah, the first one is clear because there is only one mean, but here we have two means. So yeah, but here you are taking the mean over just this one. Just this one. So, so this is sort of basically it's doing dynamic program, deterministic dynamic programming, and this one is over the stochastic. Okay. Um, yeah, there was another question. 
So in this, we are taking the most optimal uh, state in which uh, we will get the least cost. But, yeah. we are not but you don't know which is the most optimal state. That's the interesting part. In fact, when somebody said the optimistic, right? I have a different determinization for you. I have a slightly different determinization for you. I just change this and say pk dash such that pa s dash given s is the maximum. Yeah, that that should be the case. Okay. It should not be greater than zero. If you do no, if if I do that, what happens? That would basically be also from an English point of view. That's also optimistic. <coughs> that means pick make this action b s to s two. Because if you happen to know this is 0.7, this is uh, I'm sorry, if you happen to, happen to know that this is 0.1, this is 0.7, and this is 0.2, then I would have basically most optimistic, I mean most likely determinization would be essentially assuming that this will just get you to S2. Mm -hmm. And forget about the 0.7. So whenever I do this action, I'll just get S2. But then we don't that is not admissible. That is That's normal. the point I want that you to not, understand. That is not normal. <laughs> That's what I want you to understand. That's what I want you to understand. That's all I want you to understand. Okay, if you did, great. Okay, so this is called most likely outcome determinization. It may well be more informed estimate of the real cost. Yes. Than what this guy gives. Because this guy is dreamy eyed, right? He's hoping, he or she is hoping that the world will just conform to whatever is best for me. Right? Okay? So it's only better than just assuming the cost is zero. If you assume cost is zero, that would be admissible, by the way. It's just very badly informed. Okay? And this one is going to be slightly more informed, but not admissible, because all I need is one example where this won't work. And in fact, if the only way to get to the goal involves using one of the unlikely outcomes of this action, you will think that goal cannot be reached at all, so you assume that the cost of reaching goal is infinity, but actually it's finite. Yes, and there's so many people asking, yeah, go ahead. So when you say if you assume the cost is zero, that, that would be admissible, that, is that entirely accurate for SSPs? Because uh, it seems like if, if I understood the definition correctly, your costs could have a negative value as long as you don't have a cycle in the graph. In the yeah, graph. that's, yeah, I mean, you're right, but in these cases, these are all positive cost SSPs. Okay, so. Uh, and so assuming the simple positive cost SSPs, assuming zero as the heuristic, would have been fine. And, and having negative numbers without cycles essentially allows you to shift the flora so that you'll have a new zero such that there's no more negative numbers. If you have cycles, you can't shift the flora. That's the usual idea. That's a good point. I mean, you're remembering the definition of the original SSS. But here, we're just using you know, <coughs> positive cost SSS. Any other questions on this? Yeah. yeah I think the main here is yeah, min over this, but this part is on just this. Yeah. Right? And basically, it has to be that way because, you know, the, if in fact, in a deterministic problem, if I tell you my, uh, this is my, you know, I'm here, and this one is 0.9 away from the goal, and this is 0.7 away from the goal, Right? And then basically, and then if there is an action which takes me from here to here with uh, 0.1, and there's an action which takes me from here to here with 0.9, then which action am I supposed to pick? This one, because 0.1 plus 0.9 is better than 0.9 plus 0.7. Right? Okay. Other questions? Okay, so I just want you to understand this because this heuristic stuff becomes uh, background for much of the discussion here when you get to determinizations too. Uh, so exactly what are the relaxing? You understood that. Basically, you're acting as if an action which came, so, so by the way, so, so from Andar point of view, this is a beautiful picture too. Yeah, this is an Andar graph, right? Tell me what happened in terms of relaxation from this graph. Just because it's an Andar graph. 
It just became an R graph, that's it. And so you can do a star search. So wherever there is an and, you just basically made this one here, one line here. So the squares disappeared. It became an R graph. Okay, that's what you did eventually. And then the other issue is, if you took most likely outcome, it too will become an R graph, except every square is only one out, you know, the squares disappear, but previously this square now becomes two different separate edges, now it will only become one edge. Because you're just picking the most likely outcome. Okay? And I hope you understand that most likely outcome would have been more informed, but it's not admissible. And um, all outcome determination is um, very optimistic. I mean, overly optimistic, but it is admissible. That's why it is admissible. In fact, you can become admissible by being very, very optimistic. It's the pessimism that kills the admissibility. But then, you know, you remember this whole thing that you can be overly optimistic and so the heuristic won't really be computationally effective. If you put zero everywhere, then essentially that's like not having any heuristic. So there's the trade-off. Okay. So that's something that I wanted to draw your attention to. And in fact, one of the interesting things, which I might get to later on, um, is this is just the first heuristic. This is actually just one heuristic that is just, you know, in one of the papers you read, this is one heuristic. There is an entire interest right now in actually coming up with better and better heuristics, which have probably more informed um, than this, while still being admissible, that's, that's are future. giving up on admissibility altogether and just go for slightly more informed. That's in the future work of the people. Yeah, but I mean, but that's yeah, that's 2003 paper. There's a lot more work going on right now in that direction, and I'll show you, you know, in discussion hopefully at some point. So that's the connection to the whole you know, heuristic literature. Okay, um, so that's basically you know, exactly what I'm relaxing. They're assuming that they can make the best outcome of the action happen, where the best outcome, it's not the most likely outcome, the best outcome for what you want to get. And to figure that out, you first need to actually find the optimal path. Okay, and the best way to do that is to split the action into multiple different unconnected actions. And then, what if we pick uh, S dash corresponding to the highest P, then that would be the most likely determination that won't be as good. That I mean, it actually is more informed, but it's not missed. Okay. So, the next thing I'm going to do is, you know, since we were talking about this picture, and uh, LRTDP was essentially doing um, RTDP, the, the dynamic programming based sampling. Now I want to do essentially single sample all the way down, okay, which is UCT. Um, and the difference between what we're discussing today, UCT, and what we discussed last time, LRGP, is sort of the difference between uh, basically temporal difference learning one side and ADP on the other side. Okay, and the trade-offs are the same. Why you wind up doing UCT is similar to why you wind up doing any model-free learning at all. Okay, uh, so in particular, uh, there's sort of interesting background on UCT. UCT is like a currently very um, successful idea. Okay, and it's like the simplest idea. So it's like throw away the model, just use it as if it's just a simulator. Okay, and then come one sample all the way down to the terminal state. Okay, let me actually show you. Uh, get out this, this, and come back here. Come back. Yeah. So let me show you this picture so that it will be easier first, okay? Um, so I'm again trying to figure out, for now act as if I'm trying to figure out, uh, you know, remember, first of all, you have realize that LRTDP can be used either online or offline, right? If you stop LRTDP after a while and tell me what should I do right now, it will just basically tell you the greedy action from the start state, which may not be the eventually correct action because if it actually continues, until everything has been labeled solved, it will know for sure what's the best action. But you stop it in the middle, it will still tell you what's the best action you should do, which is better than just flipping a coin. Right? So LRTDP could be used either for offline computation of the optimal policy followed by just executing it, or online computation where you give yourself some amount of time and essentially then find the um, best action from the start state 
do it, find what happens, and then that becomes your new start state, and then do the LRTDB from there again. This would be more like the way game tree search works, where you go for a particular depth, figure out what's the best move, make that move, let your opponent tell you uh, what they're going to make, and then you'll again figure out. Okay. Um, anyway, so UCT will act as if we, you know, it actually make a lot more sense to think of it from an online perspective. Um, and so, in the, you know, you start from a state, and uh, you. Basically, let's say you, know, you pick an action from this state, just pick an action, okay? And then do that action, so you tell, ask the simulator, tell me, what hap tell me what happens if I do this action. The simulator won't tell you the probabilities. He'll just tell you, this is what happened when you did the action. So this happened. Then you uh, do pick an action from that state, and then do it. And then they tell you that you'll get here, you keep doing this until you hit a terminal state. At this point, you hit a terminal state. Now you know that if you start from here and you go all the way here, you know, think essentially while you're doing this, think of, for example, even if this is not a terminal state, you could have applied some kind of evaluation function, just like in game trees. And then you back it up. Okay, if you ignore cast of the actions, which we will do for now, okay, then essentially as if there is a way of getting one if you did this action. There's one way of getting one if you did this action. That's what this sample is telling me. Okay, um, so uh, I backed up one, and so I have a way of getting a one from there. And then I pick one more sample. I'm not done yet, I'll pick another sample. Um, this time, let's say I picked a different action. Okay, now you have to figure out how do you decide which action to pick. That's something that you still have to figure out. Okay, we'll act as if, you know, basically right now we will pick the best action with respect to the current policy. Okay. Um, and in fact, the problem that you will see if you think a little is, what if the current policy keeps making you pick the same action again and again and again, while there are other actions that you haven't even tried even once. Okay, keep that in mind for a minute. So let's say in this case I picked this action, and then I went all the way there, I got a zero. Terminal. So now essentially, I'll get a zero. If I go this way, I'll get a one, uh, I'll go that way. So. Uh, essentially, at this point, I have kind of a tree policy. Suppose these are the only actions I can do from this this node. I, yeah. I should add because what if one of those states would be overlap with one of these states? It's a good point. Doesn't matter. Right now, these are just samples. Those are all efficiency issues. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so right now, I would say I've tried each of the actions from this state once. Okay, so I would say I have an estimate of how good is this action versus this action. Ex you know, just the estimate. Okay, and then of course I can pick which hour, what do you think you'll pick? You obviously pick this, right? Because this is giving you a one, that's giving you a zero, you'll pick this. Okay, so now I have a tree policy underneath this node which says basically take this if you are going with, you know, if you think of this value one, this can be thought of as the Q value. Q value of doing this action in this state, this action in this state. So you assume normally if you have the Q values back and you are guessing all the samples are getting you estimates of the Q values. Okay, and these are only bad estimates right now unless the sampling is done you know, exhaustively. These are just you know, bad estimates, right? But at least you have some idea of these two and then you know, I have a three policy going. And then uh, suppose now I pick again this action uh, this time the simulator said uh, when I went to one, remember, you know, it picked another action from one and you got a different state. You went further, you got a zero this time. Now the interesting thing is, unlike here, where I had a choice of doing this action, which will give me one, choice of doing this action, which will give me zero, right now I have a choice of doing this action, and this action sometimes gives me one, sometimes gives me zero which means really the expected value, current estimate of the state is half. Okay, and then, so basically, uh, the Q value estimate for this action is half, Q value estimate for this action is zero. This is basically what I do in UC. Okay, now the question, and so now at this point, since assuming there are only two actions under this guy, again, these two, 
this state also has tried all its actions at least once. So it's now part, it has a tree policy, it's part of the tree policy. Now the thing that we want to ask in UCT, um, since I've come out of the video, I'll go forward and then come back later about the motivations for doing this. Um, one is, what is an appropriate tree policy? Would you always pick the most, the current best Q value action? Or would you do some bit of an exploration? Right? Okay. It's the same thing, you know. Basically, you would have to explore because the number of samples, the number of samples uh, are too small, let's say. That means if you tried an action in a state only at one time and you got 15 as the backed up value, you tried the other action in that state 28 times and the average backed up value is 14. First of all, it's kind of iffy to say the 14 guy is bad compared to 15 guy, because 15 guy just was tried once. Maybe there are, if you actually tried enough number of times, it's backed up value would have been much worse. And secondly, if you are trying to combine exploration with exploitation, then you want to essentially try that action, which has been tried a few times only till now, more often, even though its Q value is low. Right? It's the exact same point we did for the exploration exploitation. Yes? What was the distinction between free policies and roll-out policies? Uh, no, uh, rolling out essentially means just trying the policy all the way until you reach the EVG terminal state. So just basically selecting random actions? At exactly. That exactly. So now I'll, I'll get to that next, actually. So uh, rollout is, you know, which action actually occurs. You know, which action, you know, which outcome of the action occurs. In some sense, that's just determined by the simulator. You give the action to the simulator, it'll tell you what happened. So that's just the random uh, sam sample of the action's outcomes. Okay? Uh, the, the, the other part is, which action do you pick? That you have some control over. And normally, you would have assumed that you would just pick the action which has the current best estimated Q value. Okay, now notice, Q value is an estimate in this, even though you have the full model, because you just sampled the model just once. Q value is an estimate in the reinforcement learning, true reinforcement learning scenario, because you haven't even tried some of the transitions. You don't actually have the model, and you know the best what you have found till now is again an estimate. Okay, whatever the reason, it's an estimate, and you don't want to put too much emph you know, emphasis on the estimate, you want to give it, you know, throw in an exploration component. Okay, so again, you consider these numbers. The number of times action A has been taken in S, and NS is the number of times state has been, S has been encountered. Okay, remember we used this in figuring out the exploration function in the you know, uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, here I'll give you a very specific exploration function. And this, if you use this exploration function, that's what is called UCT these days. Okay. So you just say you pick the uh, action that maximizes the following sum, Q of S A plus some constant times ln of N of S by N of S A. And effect of this is to make those actions which haven't yet been tried in this state be given a little bit of a push. So that they will look better than what their Q value would tell you. You're adding them to the Q value, adding this bonus factor to the Q value. It's an affirmative action for untried actions. That's exactly what we did for exploration. Okay. And the reason this particular formula has been used is there are actually you know, some good proofs about some properties of this particular exploration function, which I won't go into here. Okay. But it does have the right form for an exploration function, right? If you tried this action in this state many, many, many times, then essentially this path will become close to zero. In which case, you will actually only be based on that Q value. You do care about the constant C, that is sort of the scale factor. How are you combining this bonus, this bonus marks with the real marks for this you know, state action? And this C, you know, people actually have to set. It's a fudge factor in doing UCD. Okay. 
But if you do this, you know, this is the exploration term. And again, as I said, am I doing learning or planning here? I'm doing planning. I have the full model. I decided not to look at the full model and instead do sampling over full model. Okay, would this ever make any sense? I mean, I said it makes sense for lazy people, but you know, could laziness ever make sense? And that's what I actually want to go back, and then this is, this is a constant that needs to be set, you know, per problem, that's what I said. Okay, um, and then, so basically you use this in deciding which action to pick from each state. So if certain actions haven't been picked enough times, then when you come back to that state, then you will give a higher, you know, a little extra boost to them so that you will pick them. And the good property is that once you try enough number of times that action on that state, then you will really be based only on the Q value of the action rather than on the exploration. Now, would this idea work? You know, this looks like, you know, if LRTDP is doing uh, prioritized sweeping, this one is actually throwing the model right out the window. And it's saying, giving it to somebody, it's like, you know, <laughs> it's like what? Um, it's like, you could read the textbook, you know, and, and then figure out, uh, you know, if I ask you to figure out the answers for some vocabulary questions, right? You could actually read the vocabulary question answers yourself, or uh, if you're feeling lazy, you can give it to your friend and say, ask me a question, I'll give an answer, and you just tell me yes or no. A lot of you do this. This is a very inefficient way of learning. Right? <laughs> right? You may as well look at you know, what its true answer is and try to understand that. But we all play this game. You know, it's just too many questions to ask. So there's this huge big book, I'll give it to my friend, they'll pick some random problems, I'll ask me those problems, I'll feel, I'll give answers if I, and if I'm giving enough good answers, I feel good, if not, you know, I'll say anyway, it's too late, I go to sleep. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? That's what UCD is doing. Can this ever be a reasonable idea? To understand this, first of all, to understand this, you know, you realize that this picture, uh, this entire picture, Even as I was looking at this, I said, think of this as game trees. I told you, right? I mean, because if you are game tree, here you are playing against the nature. So the simulator is telling you the nature's, um, nature's uh, move. Right? Simulator is telling you the nature's move. And then, uh, then basically that move happens, and then you get to make your move, the, uh, the nature gets to make its move, and then you reach a terminal state. Now here's the interesting thing. Is there anything in the way I described UCT that requires that nature play, play fair? You know, you don't know what the simulator is doing. It's just telling you, if you did this action, this is the outcome. You didn't check whether or not that's the case. You know, when you're playing with your friend with this vocabulary test, you know, once in a while, your friend can basically just, they don't want you to do well in the exam, they'll just mess with your brain, saying, you know, no, yeah, you're wrong on this, you're right on this other one, where it's actually the opposite way. Okay, and then they'll get a better grade, hopefully. Okay, so that, there's nothing stopping that from happening in this picture, as far as I'm concerned. When you decide to act, do the action in this state, you ask the simulator, tell me what happens. And the simulator tells you. Currently, my simulator is playing fair. It has the full model. It's actually tossing a coin. But my simulator can actually be an opponent who wants to make me lose the game. So I argue that you can do UCT instead of min-max search for chess. Just the whole thing looks like chess, right? I mean, the whole thing basically, this is just a game against the nature. Okay, you could have done min-max, uh, you know, if you did min-max from, you know, previously, it basically, min-max thing does dynamic programming style update. It will look at all the possible uh, actions from a state, all the possible, um, you know, responses from each of the, uh, you know, each of the states from the min guy, and then backs up the whole thing. But you could just play one game all the way down with the simulator. And then you got one sample of chess game. And then you figure out what should have been the best action I should have done from state one. Do you see what I'm saying? 
it's all connected and i hope that you see it's all connected but you should know how they are different okay so here is you know i'm saying that this idea you see d can be play used to play games to do chess now the question is if i want to tell you it actually is the best chess champion out there then you'll suddenly stand up and take notice and say hey if the thing is winning chess and chess i know the rules so i have the full model and the only reason i do this approximate reasoning only reason i do approximate reasoning is because i'm lazy because it just takes too much time to compute the entire you know policy using the model so i do online reasoning and then so if i want to tell you the current best chess players are actually using uct not min max search then all of a sudden you would be interested fortunately i can't tell you that <laughs> but i can tell you something different is a game that's much much harder than chess what is it go go right and you know as as i say in 471 you know chess is interesting enough that people are still willing to play with the computers because sometimes people can win sometimes computers are winning you know and chinook i'm sorry, so the, like there are games you know that like checkers it's not worth playing with the computer it's like playing weight lifting with a crane yeah <laughs> like, none of us do it we gave up on that stuff we, that's already done done we we don't play weight lifting with a crane so we never do checkers with the computers we still do chess with the computers we also don't do go with the computers but that's a completely different reason computers are so stupid at go that anybody who knows go would never play with computers currently game playing holy grail is go you got your attention now now i get to that game it's go and don't ask me how to play it i don't know any of these games the rules are very difficult go and you should read about this and uh, you know i think uh, there are cultures i think japanese are crazy about go um and uh, Are you Japanese? Okay, so then I can say there's no Japanese here, right? So I can stereotype Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so is my student Will Cushing. You know, he could have been done with his PhD long back if he wasn't that crazy about Go. Um, and there are Go clubs, and people still play Go and all that stuff. And the crazy, crazy thing about Go, it turns out, is it has a um, it has like a terrible, terrible branching. Path. way to be a branching pack from any given you know move from any given board configuration the number of things you can do is just so big that if you try to even do min max tree for a couple of moves down you go out of space you see what i'm saying yes and so go has been pretty hard to actually do well uh, you know if a computer games and uct has actually improved the 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 state of the art for go play so i kind of made this you know this thing is working well in game play and in fact the entire idea was you know that's one of the things that's interesting about the entire game playing uh, techniques because you know darpa couldn't care less I and mean, the military funders couldn't care less about who wins the chess game or who wins the go game right and yet ideas that are developed in playing you know those games by the computers have great great uh, applications in problems that don't look at all like games they just games against you know much nicer adversaries like nature nature is so much nicer compared to uh, you know opponents who actually want to do the maximum damage to And if this thing is doing well for them, then of course it should do fine for nature too. Yes, sir. Now, um, UCT is originally designed for uh, MVP specifically, which have a static um, probability, they have a static transition system. Mm -hmm. But when you're playing against an opponent or when you're doing something of that nature, the, the transition system itself is more dynamic. I mean, the opponent has no set model in their head where they say, Okay, in this state, I'm going to say it's a 30% chance I'm going to transition. No, you can state. play this. No, actually, the interesting thing is you can play it. The, the whole point of min-max tree, for example, is you assume that the opponent does have 
does know exactly what their translation function is. They're going to pick the move that's most damaging to you. So, okay. so it is true that the opponent sometimes doesn't do the thing that is most damaging to you. And so if you play as if the opponent is actually trying to do that, you will look like a sort of silly person. You know, my example from the 471 is, if you are ever playing chess with your two-year-old nephew, don't think two hours for every move. Because the nephew probably can't tell the difference between the chess piece and a chocolate. <laughs> Right? And you're still thinking what's the best move to make because I know you're trying to get me. Right? <laughs> he or she is not trying to get you. They're just playing. Do you see what I'm saying? So min-max is meant for perfectly rational opponent, which actually makes you know, life simpler. And in fact, you know, the, 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 point, the question that you ask is an interesting question, um, but in games, all you care about is not losing. You don't win games, you want to not lose games in chess, etc. That's why the three hour chess is second only to golf on TV. You know, if you play the grandmaster chess on TV, it's just as boring as golf on TV, I think. Um, and so basically, everybody is trying to make sure that they don't lose. Because you lose, you're in big trouble. And if you overestimate your opponent, you won't lose. Okay, but people can laugh at you because you know you are playing this really carefully constructed game with a two year old. But anyway, so going back to this picture here, if so UCT has actually been shown to be very useful for Go, existential proof. And Go has the following property that it has enormous branching factor. Because of which, just computing a Bellman, computing a min-max backup is basically impossible. Even if you just go k levels, k equal to two, you still have too big a tree. And normally, unless you go deep enough, you don't see the traps. Okay, and it's basically impossible to do, you know, multi-ply lookup. And so, UCT-based techniques do better than min-max style techniques. You know, simple min-max style techniques. Okay, now having said that, uh, if you have games against nature, notice that all I said has nothing to do, whatever I said in, in describing why UCD is useful for Go, did not mention the nature of the opponent. It only mentioned the nature of the dynamics of the game from your point of view. So if you're playing a game against nature, a planning domain, where you have way too many actions from any state, then you'll have the same exact problem with LRTDP or any RTDP-based backup because RTDP tree looks just like min-max tree. Instead of doing min and max and min and max, it does expected and max and expected and max backup. And the reason it dies, you know, for those kinds of domains is because the tree becomes too big. And you can avoid that by doing UCT. Okay? So, UCT has been tried based on the advantages you go, it has been tried in planning, and in fact it has been done, it has done quite well, you know, especially in domains which have essentially the, the, these kinds of characteristics, very high branching factor, okay? And the transition function is so big then that it's essentially uh, writing just K-level lookup becomes too big a tree. At that point, just doing samples and throwing the entire um, transition function into a simulator and asking the simulator to tell you is better. Again, so I'm arguing that sometimes the best way to prepare for an exam is not to study the textbook. If you only have one day left and the textbook is this big, right, what are you going to do? You have to simulate having a friend who arbitrarily picks problems and asks questions. This thing. Either you can do it yourself, randomly go. If you start from the beginning of the textbook and read the first 10 pages until, you, until the time runs out, that's probably bad policy. Right? So sampling sometimes is better. Even though you have the textbook, you will actually use it to, because of the time constraint you find out. Okay, so that's where uh, uh, UCT comes in. And in fact, as I said, it's been used in Go, it's been used in Klondike, uh, and generally it's been used in uh, planning uh, domains also, and in probabilistic planning, UCT has been used, and it does well. 
quite well. Um, again, the issue, one big issue becomes, um, one big issue becomes, actually, before I go off here, um, you should know the whole idea of one-armed bandit. How many of you know one-armed bandits? <laughs> yeah. So uh, the idea of one-armed bandit is this guy is called a one-armed bandit. Okay, so you go to Las Vegas, you play these kind of slot games, it has one arm and it's a bandit, it's taking all your money, right? <laughs> so, so in, you know, basically in OR and mathematics, they call these slot machines one arm bandits. Okay, and you can have multi arm bandits. And in some sense, what you're doing, I mean, some, the UCT ideas originally arose in multi arm bandit problems. And they have then been extended to go. And then now we are using it in planning. That's the direction. Okay. So you should at least know this bandit problem. There's an entire you know, literature on um, these things. And you know, in fact, this, this stuff, the generally good characteristics of this particular exploration function actually has been established in the multi arm bandit problem. So the summary of UCT is, I hope you understood. I think you can look at this. Um, and then you can improve UCT too. You can initialize the state action pairs with a heuristic so that upfront you see the Q values. So if you computed that heuristic that I mentioned to you earlier, now you might ask, how do I compute that heuristic? If I don't have the model in front of me, can I compute that heuristic? Remember, I took an action and split it into more actions. If my real problem was that I have too many actions, splitting each action into more actions isn't going to help me any. Did you see what I'm saying? Right? So, in fact, if you are using UCT for domains that it is really meant for, where you have too many actions, this idea won't work. But if you're using UCT because you are truly, truly lazy, right? In the, there are very few actions, and you can actually do the entire policy and value iteration under 15 minutes and you still feel like playing the sampling game. Okay, then you may you can improve your performance a little bit by actually doing the heuristic up. Okay. And then you can also talk about better than random rollout policy. So you had the full model and you threw it into the simulator and told simulator just, you know, tell me what happens. But you do know that you have the full model. So you might actually tell the simulator to do better than just simulating nature. For example, you can make it simulate less likely outcomes more often in the beginning, just so that you will get those back up. Okay? For the same reason the exploration thing works, for example. Again, you can do that for a simulator because simulator is under your control to some extent. You do, it's like you know, you're going to ask your friend, oh by the way, ask me more questions from this chapter. For example, you can do that. Okay, those are also kind of ideas. But this area, the UCT area, is, is a hugely um, hot area right now. Lots of people are trying to figure out in what places can you apply this, and what are the theoretical guarantees, under what conditions, what kind of domains is UCT going to work well. Uh, the real issue here, of course, is you know if you compare, if you compare this idea with policy iteration idea, which would you rather understand, if you have to understand in a couple of minutes time? This is a no-brainer. There's nothing to understand here. All the tricky part is actually showing it works, you know, the convergence proofs. But understanding the algorithm is so simple. Okay, policy iteration actually you need to understand, you know, exactly how each of the steps works. Okay. Um, so, in some sense, it's like a bit of a, a letdown that after doing all the hard algorithms, now we say that the easy algorithms, the easy to understand algorithms are actually the better, you know, performing algorithms. So that's the way I like this. Okay. Um, that's why I didn't do UCT first. If I told you UCT first and then say it works well, then you won't let me do any of the other stuff. You know, so, so this is a paper that um, you could read. I don't know whether this is the one. Maybe you should read on the side. Uh, this one uh, basically compares LRTDP versus UCT on the competition domains. Okay. Um, 
and uh, and essentially basically says, not surprisingly, that UCT is not as good, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, for for the class of domains they considered, because LRTDP knows, for example, labeling, and it knows how to say when to stop, you know, continuing exploration. In fact, LRTDP basically doesn't have a separate exploration component because it looks at all the actions up front. Okay, uh, now the very fact that you have to write this paper shows you how things have, what, what a kind of a pass the things have come to. You have to write a paper saying what looks like an obviously dumb idea and these working miracles is actually sometimes dumb. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what this paper is saying. Right? Except they go with uh, planning competition domains which don't all have necessarily the kind of high branching factor that UCT does better with. Or rather, those are the cases where only UCT is the reasonable game in town. LRTDP doesn't even have a chance. But when both LRTDP and UCT are possibly applicable, then LRTDP actually certainly does better because it uses the model. Okay, now the interesting question of course is when did this paper get written? This was published in this summer. And you can read this and understand, essentially. Because you know all the background on LRTDP, you know the background on UCT, because there's very little background on UCT. The tricky part of UCT is understanding the convergence proof that I'm skipping here. Okay, the algorithm itself anybody can write. And in fact, you wish I give you like a programming assignment on UCT, not on LRTDP. You know, even if I give an assignment on LRTDP, please don't ask us to do the label propagation because that's the hard part. <laughs> right? You know, the other stuff is easy. Okay? So that's the connection. That's basically the other type of idea. Um, any questions on this topic? Okay. So in a way, actually, I would argue that, you know, I try to see this you know, think about uh, when do you use model free learning and I try to say essentially this whole idea of swimming is something where, you know, you probably want to use model free learning, okay? And then again, the reason for swimming, I mean, I think part of the motivation there is the same as part of the motivation for Go. In the case of swimming, up front I didn't even know the model. In case of Go, I happen to know the model. It's just too big. But both of them have, you know, are hard for um, model-based anything because the models are too big. And so you do simulator-based approaches or model-free approaches. Okay? So that's, there are a lot of connections between reinforcement learning and approximate methods for MDPs. Okay. So the last part I'm going to do today um, is get into, so by the way, this is something that was in the back of all our discussion. I should mention this, that if I am trying to solve an MDP, I mentioned this actually in, in just verbally earlier, uh, solve an MDP and also act using the policy computed, I can compute the entire policy offline and then just start executing it. The advantage of this is runtime, you don't waste any time at all, whatsoever. Okay, um, but the disadvantage uh, is that you may take forever. It in fact, it's impossible to compute the entire policy. So actually chess you can just compute the entire policy for chess up front, right? You can compute, by the way, the entire policy for tic-tac-toe up front, okay? Uh, you can also do that for chess. It's just, you know, the reason you don't do it is the same thing that, you know, like Archimedes, when he was drunk on this uh, principle of uh, liver, said, just give me a long enough uh, stick and a fulcrum point and I can lift the earth itself. And of course, in those days, he didn't know that, in fact, in space, Earth doesn't have that much of a weight, but that's a different story. So he's just assumed that if you can only give me long enough stick and a fulcrum, I can lift Earth using the principle of labor, okay? And the same thing, um, um, you know, say you have an analogy here. And then uh, for the online case, um, essentially you are saying, I would make an action decision, apply it, then you know, basically that buys me time. Uh, because, for example, nature may take some time to tell me the consequences of my action. Okay? 
um, in which case then nature tells me when it comes and tells me, then I can then figure out what to do from the new state that has been presented to me. And that's basically what you do in game playing, for example. You don't compute the entire um, you know, policy up front because it's just too big. Okay. Um, so both are options for solving, and then you know I think LRTDP can be used either here or here. In fact, UCT also can be used in either place. It turns out. Okay, because you can essentially just keep doing um, the sampling on the simulator until you get a tree policy for the entire space. Okay. Min-max search can be done for the entire game or just for what's the best uh, action to make for the current state. The same thing. But you do want to keep this online versus offline uh, thing in back of the head. Uh, so one last thing I want to say is since we are in samples, I'm going to change and you know this is the one actually going to read the paper for next week. Um, and then we'll discuss more of it. Um, uh, called FFR, but you know, it essentially comes from the FFP plan. So the idea is um, that I, you know, the best way to understand it is from an online perspective. Uh, so I had a state, and I can do an action A1, which will get me to these two states. I can do action A2, which will get me to these three states. Those are the only actions. I need to pick which action to do. And I have a goal, you know, basically it's an SSP. I know, you know, the goal and I know the cost and so on. And right now I'm at this state. I can take some time and figure out what's the best action to do. And then once I do this action, the simulator or the opponent will tell me, nature will tell me what my next state is. And then I do the same thing from there. Right? It's very similar. Um, now, the way you could have done this using UCT is essentially uh, from here A1, and then essentially I can compute the backed up values for this state, backed up value for this state, etc., and then compute the uh, expected value for the actions, and then decide which one is the best action. For example, if you were to do UCT. A different idea is basically the determination idea. It says don't just use the simulator if you do have the model in front of you. In the UCT case, you don't use the model. You just give the model away to the simulator. And the simulator tells you, and you can only ask the simulator, if I do this, what happens? If I do this, what happens? OK. If you have the model in front of you, for example, what you can do is you can solve a relaxation of the problem, starting from this state, OK? And see how, so for example, let's say I want to figure out whether uh, uh, this action is better, this action is better, and that depends on the values of these states, let's say. And then what I can do is, starting from this state, how costly is it to reach the goal state? Assuming deterministic code. How costly is it to reach the goal state from here, assuming deterministic code? That would actually involve planning in your head. So you take the model, you relax it, to make it deterministic, and then do planning, deterministic planning. Compute the estimated values you get from here to here, and then back up those values. This is obviously using the model much more than just simulating the model one sample at a time. OK? Now, that's what basically I would do. Uh, and the basic idea here is how do I determinize? Okay, and this would have been particularly interesting. I mean, particularly new if we haven't already spent all the time in the beginning of the class going over that other heuristic, and that was all about how to determinize, you know, MDPs. And so you can determinize an MDP if you are actually have a multiple FX. You can either pick a most likely, pick the most likely outcome that will give you the most likely determinization, or you can pick the all outcome determinization. Either way, you have a deterministic planning problem. And furthermore, in fact, it turns out that you know, in a, if you, at an atomic level, deterministic planning problems are deterministic graph search, just graph search. At the proposition, at the factored level, which you know, I've been hinting in the background that you know, you actually want to have algorithms that work at state literal level rather than atomic state level, 
there are very efficient planners out there you know that work directly at the uh, positional level okay and in particular there is a planner called fs which just you know is a pretty fast planner somebody wrote this and people keep basically improving it and uh, it's called fast forward and and it does forward search in the space of states and get to the gets to the goal where you know and figures out the optimal plan very fast and not optimal really but you know close to optimal plan very fast and so the word uh, is basically i will take my actions in terms of this factored representation i will determinize them either you know with most likely outcome determinization or all outcome determinization and then i'll get a deterministic planning problem i throw it over the uh, thing to my you know to ff uh, which is my planner right deterministic planner he'll tell me the full plan okay so in fact even simpler than what i'm doing here is this idea where if i'm at state s and i need to get to g and if i get to g i get some points okay what i could do is i could determinize my model and uh, basically get a deterministic model using either this one or this one and you know what are the trade offs and then you call ff ff will tell you this is the plan this is the best path to go from here to here so you can start executing it so you know this first action then you get to this if in fact things work out in your favor you get this state okay and then you if you are in this state you know the action to do you do this action then you get here and all that and then you get to g now unless you are extremely lucky this is not going to happen once in a while you would stray from the states that you are expecting now suppose after you came here you suddenly found that when you did a2 from this state you get this state not this one i just call ff from this state to goal state get a new plan okay from there to goal state and start executing it right start executing it and then keep doing this until i reach the goal state now if in fact you know both most likely out most likely outcome determination will at least take the probabilities into account except it just said the max of the probabilities all outcome determination ignores the probabilities completely and there's idea a system called ff replan essentially used both of those ideas ff no say most Uh, most likely determination and all outcome determination and as i mentioned a couple of classes back um on my last class i don't remember when i mentioned this this was ff free plan was tried as a straw man approach you know basically people, the guy you know sang woo kyun who actually used to be here as a postdoc uh, tried this uh, because he had a much better approach and he just wanted to do a sanity check and he played this on you know on the competition and that year competition it won right and uh, so the problem is uh, you know first of all you can just say well you know the the imposter won the competition so you have two options one is either change the competition or two figure out why is imposter actually winning the competition and uh, both have been tried you know people actually try changing the competition so that the imposter will lose and a little tweak to the imposter makes it win again and at some point of time so people started talking about probabilistic planning competition where you have probabilistically interesting problems and those are defined as the one that ff replan doesn't do well on unfortunately the other guys weren't doing particularly well on those either so then go back and change the problems again until you know he get to you know defeating the imposter at some point of time you say to heck with this imposter nonsense let's actually try to figure out why is the imposter winning and you should not be surprised that this is a good idea if you ct wins yeah. <laughs> why can't this win this thing is actually thinking more than you ct and so you will read a paper which is actually an extension of ff replan paper called um, hindsight optimization which essentially basically not only explains on why ff replan works but also improves the determinization such that they take probabilities into account and solve the problems that way using ff and by doing that they will wind up essentially in fact the problem for these kinds of deep learning based approaches is if the domain is non ergodic 
you know, then you actually reach this state, you die, let's say. Then you don't live to do replanning. <laughs> right? So if the domains are non-ergodic, so one way of making things probabilistically interesting is to put large number of bounds. And so in planning, there used to be you know, domains called blocks world. And so not surprisingly, the probabilistic planning has exploding blocks world, where blocks just randomly explode if you put them on the wrong configuration. And that was to see whether, in fact, if you don't take probabilities into account, you should pay for the, pay the price. Okay. So it is actually possible you know, for uh, a non-ergodic domains, FF plan to do badly. But then if it then becomes more aware of the probabilities in the model, it can do better. You come up with better determinizations, not just all outcome, not just, uh, you know, most likely, but something, you know, which is more general than that. And you read a paper on that when you discuss that when you come back.